Hello, listeners. A quick announcement before we get started. The next few episodes will be coming out as I finish them, instead of on the usual bi-weekly schedule. I'm in the process of a big move and won't be able to dedicate as much time as I'd like to research. I'm not comfortable releasing episodes without sufficient research, so sadly, the schedule will be affected, but the quality will remain consistent. I hope you can forgive the variable schedule. If you'd rather we kept to the schedule by reading a few short horror stories in place of episodes until I'm settled, we can do that. But let us know on social media so we can start organizing it soon. The Morbid Curiosity Podcast continues to be sponsored by Audible.com. If you're busy like me, but you still want to read up on all sorts of morbid history or keep up with the latest science fiction and fantasy writers, Audible is the way to go. There are over 180,000 titles to choose from, and you can listen to these audiobooks on your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or other MP3 players while you work, cook, on your commute, or at the gym. MCP listeners can get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial by going to audibletrial.com slash mcp. If you sign up for the free trial, you get a free audiobook that is yours to keep, and the MCP gets the funding it needs to keep bringing morbid history to your ears. I have some recommendations for books you can find about today's topic, but I'll get to that later. For now, on with the episode. Humans are fascinated by gore and violence, but even more so the mysterious and unsolved. This interest in disturbing and unpleasant subjects is called morbid curiosity, and it has gripped hundreds of people throughout the ages. I am one of those people. My name is Hallie, and this is the Morbid Curiosity Podcast. World War II was a time of great strife. The Allies, made up of Great Britain, the USA, China, and the Soviet Union, and the Axis powers, made up of Germany, Italy, and Japan, were at constant odds, both vying for command of Europe, North Africa, and other parts of the world. The goal of the Axis powers was to promote fascism and spread their own influence over the rest of Europe, while the Allies fought for a free and independent Europe. Both powers schemed and spied, trying to find a weakness in their enemies. Spies had infiltrated both sides, each trying to predict their enemy's next move. This is the story of one of the spies for the Allies, a spy that was so unique there has never been another like him. This was a spy whose career began just after he died. In a tiny windowless basement room in Whitehall, England, a small group of highly intelligent and creative minds called NID-17 worked tirelessly handling British espionage agents, analyzing the information those agents brought to them about the enemy, and coming up with new ways to throw off Hitler and his Nazi armies. Among them were Charles Cholmondeley and Captain Ewan Montague. Captain Ewan Montague was a British judge, writer, and naval intelligence officer. Charles Cholmondeley was a flight lieutenant in the Royal Air Force, who had been seconded to MI5, Britain's domestic counterintelligence and security service. He had also been appointed as the Secretary of the Twenty Committee, a small inter-service, inter-departmental intelligence team in charge of double agents. These men had a very important assignment. Find a way to hide the Allied plan to take the island of Sicily, just off the coast of Italy in the Mediterranean Sea. A recent campaign had won the Allies the northern coast of Africa. The next step was obvious. Go across the Mediterranean Sea and into Europe. To get into Europe, however, the armies would have to pass Sicily, risking an attack by Axis forces that existed on the island. Therefore, Sicily had to be taken before the Allies could launch an attack on Europe that wouldn't end in heavy losses. Control of the island would also open the Mediterranean Sea to Allied shipping and allow the invasion of continental Europe through Italy. As I said, this step was obvious, not only to the Allies, but to the Axis as well. The Allies had to find a way to obscure their intentions to convince the enemy they planned to attack a different target. There were many ideas on how this bit of deception could be done, each as risky as the next. 
These ideas were all collected in a paper that compared deceiving the enemy with fly fishing, called the Trout Memo. It was circulated by John Godfrey, Rear Admiral and Director of Naval Intelligence. But as historian Ben McIntyre states, the paper was likely written by Godfrey's personal assistant, Lieutenant Commander Ian Fleming, the man who would later author the James Bond series of novels. One idea on this list particularly piqued Montague and Chalmondeley's interest. This idea was number 28 on the list, and it was called a suggestion, not a very nice one. The suggestion was to plant misleading papers on a corpse that would then be made available to be found by the enemy. This idea sprung from a novel by Basil Thompson, in which a corpse was dressed as an airman with secret dispatches in his pockets and dropped on the coast. Planting fake documents for the enemy to find was not a new idea. It was known as a haversack ruse and had been used many times by the British and other peoples in both world wars. The other inspiration for the final version of the scheme came from a mission that almost failed miserably. In September of 1942, an aircraft flying from Britain to Gibraltar, the same Gibraltar we spoke of in the last episode, crashed off the coast of Cadiz in Spain. All passengers were killed, including Paymaster Lieutenant James Haddon Turner, who was carrying top-secret documents. Turner's documents included a letter describing that General Dwight D. Eisenhower of the United States, the Supreme Commander of the Allied Forces, would arrive in Gibraltar on the eve of the invasion's target date of November the 4th. Turner's body washed up on the beach and was found by the Spanish authorities. The body was returned to the British, with the letter still on it. Technicians determined that the letter had not been opened, but Allied intelligence sources revealed later that a notebook carried by a French agent, who had also perished in the crash, had been copied by the Germans. Thankfully, the Germans dismissed the notebook as disinformation. Even though the situation thankfully resolved without revealing Allied plans, it did reveal that material obtained by the Spanish, who were supposedly neutral, was being passed to the Germans. Montague and Chalmondele decided to turn this to their advantage. If they could pass a corpse off as a top-level agent with believable secret missives on its person, the documents would surely be leaked to German agents in Spain, hiding the true goal of the Allied armies and possibly fooling Hitler into moving his armies away from the real target. The death toll would be reduced substantially and the Allies would have a safe route into Europe. The first step was to acquire a corpse. During a war, this might seem like a relatively simple task. However, for the plan to work, the corpse had to appear as if it had been in an ocean plane crash and had survived for a short time before dying at sea. The deception also had to be good enough to fool a medical examiner, as it was likely the body would be analyzed before it was returned to Great Britain. A representative of MI6, Britain's Foreign Intelligence Service, Frank Foley, assisted Montague and Chalmondele as they began to work on the logistics of the plan. Montague also approached experienced pathologist Sir Bernard Spilsbury to learn in more detail what kind of body they needed to fool a pathologist. Spilsbury rightly told Montague that those who died in air crashes over the sea often died from shock, not drowning so it wasn't completely necessary for the lungs to be filled with water. He also added that Spaniards were usually Roman Catholic, which meant they didn't do post-mortem examinations unless the cause of death was of great importance. Spilsbury suggested that the corpse needed for the operation could have died from one of many different causes, all of which could be confused with shock or drowning in an autopsy. Montague was relieved as this meant that not only would they have a better chance of finding the right body for the operation, the chance of the entire operation succeeding was higher than they previously thought. There was still the issue of obtaining the right corpse. For advice on this matter, Montague went to Bentley Purchase, the coroner of the Northern District of London. Purchase informed him that there would be practical and legal difficulties in doing so. Despite there being many bodies to choose from, each one was accounted for, meaning that they would be missed by relatives or other official bodies. Also, if Montague went around asking for corpses, which was an odd request at any time, 
information about their movements might be noticed and reported to the enemy, putting the entire mission in jeopardy. Purchase agreed to look out for a body that was technically suitable and had no relatives who would claim the corpse for burial. On January 28, 1943, Purchase contacted Montague. He had found the perfect corpse. The body belonged to a man named Glyndor Michael, a tramp who had died from eating rat poison that contained phosphorus, either on purpose or because it was laced in a scrap of food left out as bait for rats. Montague kept the man's identity confidential. The only identifying remark he made was that the man was, quote, a bit of a ne'er-do-well, and that the only worthwhile thing that he ever did, he did after his death. The identity remained secret until 1996, when Roger Morgan, an amateur historian from London, uncovered evidence in the public record office that the identity of the corpse was likely Michael. The suitability of Michael's body was verified by purchase. The small amount of poison in the system would not be identified in a body that was supposed to have been floating in the sea for several days. The body was undernourished, and Montague felt that it did not look fit enough to be a field officer. But Purchase reminded him that the man only had to look like a staff officer, which more often worked in the office. Purchase kept the body in the mortuary refrigerator at a temperature of 4 degrees Celsius, or 39 degrees Fahrenheit. If it were any colder, the flesh would freeze, a condition that would be obvious after the body defrosted. Purchase also warned Montague and Chomondele that the body had to be used within the following three months, or it would decompose too much to be useful. Now that they had a corpse, it was time to set their scheme in motion. On the 4th of February, Montague and Chomondele filed their plan for the operation with the rest of the 20 committee. They called it Operation Mincemeat, and the plan was to place false documents on the corpse, then float it off the coast of Spain, where it would be found and searched by German spies. The plan was approved by the committee, and the two men now had to create a false yet believable identity for their deceased agent. The legend, or fictitious background and character for the body that they came up with, was Captain Acting Major William Martin of the Royal Marines assigned to Combined Operations Headquarters. The name Martin was chosen, as there were several other Martins of similar rank in the Royal Marines. Royal Marines, and now Major Martin, came under Admiralty authority, and it would therefore be easier to ensure that all official inquiries and messages about his death would be rooted to the Naval Intelligence Division, where Montague and Chalmondele worked. Also helpful was that Royal Marines wore battle dress uniforms, which were easily obtainable and came in standard sizes. The rank of acting major made Martin senior enough to be entrusted with sensitive documents, but not so prominent that anyone would expect to know him. To reinforce the idea that Martin was a real person, Montague and Chalmondele created corroborative details that would be carried on his person, known in espionage as wallet or pocket litter. They added a photograph from an invented fiancé named Pam, but in reality the photo was of an MI5 clerk, Jean Leslie. Two love letters from Pam were also included in the pocket litter as was a receipt for a diamond engagement ring from a well-known jewelry shop in London. Other fictitious personal letters were included, such as a letter from Martin's father, who had a character that Ben McIntyre described as pompous and pedantic, as only an Edwardian father could be, a note from the family solicitor, and a message from a well-known British bank demanding payment of an overdraft. They even took the time to determine which inks to use so that the majority of these letters remained legible after being soaked with seawater. Other pocket litter that was placed on Martin included a book of stamps, cigarettes, matches, a set of keys, a pencil, and a receipt for a new shirt. There was also a silver cross and a St. Christopher's medallion to indicate that he was Catholic. To show when Martin had last been in London, ticket stubs from a London theater and a bill for four nights at a hotel were added, placing him there from the 18th to the 24th of April. For Martin's naval identity card, Montague and Chalmondele attempted to photograph the corpse in lifelike positions, but it was terribly obvious the man was dead. Therefore, Montague and Chalmondele searched for someone who resembled the corpse 
and found a captain in MI5 who was a close match. The captain agreed to be photographed for the identity card, wearing a Royal Marine uniform. However, the ID card looked too new for a long-serving officer, so it was made to seem as if it had been issued as a recent replacement for lost originals. Then, Montague spent the next few weeks rubbing the card on his trousers to give it a used look. The naval uniform Martin would wear was also new, so in order to distress it, it was worn by Chalmondeley, who was about the same build as Martin. For the decoy documents Martin would carry, Montague outlined three criteria that needed to be included in them for a spy to take the bait. The target should be casually but clearly identified. Next, it should name Sicily and another location as a decoy to throw off suspicion of armies mobilizing near those areas. Finally, it should be in an unofficial correspondence that would not normally be sent by diplomatic courier or an encoded signal. Following these criteria, the main document was a personal letter from Lieutenant General Sir Archibald Nye, Vice Chief of the Imperial General Staff who had a deep knowledge of all ongoing military operations, to General Sir Harvard Alexander, commander of the Anglo-American 18th Army Group in Algeria and Tunisia under General Eisenhower. To keep the appearance of the letter natural, Nye himself was asked to draw up the letter and cover the required points. The letter covered several other purportedly sensitive subjects, such as the unwanted award of Purple Heart Medals by U.S. forces to British servicemen serving with them, and the appointment of a new commander of the Brigade of Guards. Here is a quote from the key part of the letter. We have recent information that the Bosch, the Germans, have been reinforcing and strengthening their defenses in Greece and Crete, and CIGS, Chief of the Imperial General Staff, felt that our forces for the assault were insufficient. It was agreed by the Chiefs of Staff that the 5th Division should be reinforced by one brigade group for the assault on the beach south of Cape Araxos, and that a similar reinforcement should be made for the 56th Division at Kalamata. Another letter was also placed on Martin, an introduction from his commanding officer to the Admiral of the Fleet. Martin was referred to as an amphibious warfare expert on loan until after the assault. The introduction also included a clumsy joke about sardines, which Montague inserted with hope that the Germans would see it as a reference to a planned invasion of Sardinia. A single black eyelash was placed within the letter as a way to check if the Germans or Spanish had opened it. An issue Montague and Chalmondele had to consider was the possibility that, as most of Spain was Roman Catholic, their prejudice against tampering with corpses could cause them to miss the documents stored in the corpse's pockets. To avoid this, they put them in an official briefcase that would not be overlooked. They attached it to Martin's belt with a leather-covered chain, the type used by bank and jewelry couriers to secure their cases against snatching. Now they had to decide where the body should be delivered in order for it to be found quickly. Thanks to the earlier crash and recovery, the western coast of Spain seemed to be the ideal location, especially Huelva on the southwest coast. The tides and currents were also best suited to ensure that the body landed where they wanted it to. Even better, there was a very active German agent with excellent contacts both official and otherwise. That agent was Adolf Klaus, the son of the German consul who operated under the cover of an agricultural technician. He was an efficient and effective operative who wouldn't pass up on an opportunity like the one they were presenting him. The method of delivery of Martin also had to be decided. The body was supposed to be an airplane crash victim, but trying to simulate an accident at sea using flares and other devices was deemed too risky. Eventually, a submarine was chosen as the method of delivering the corpse to the region. However, to transport the body by submarine, it needed to be contained within the boat in some sort of canister that was airtight and could keep the corpse as fresh as possible during its journey. Spilsbury was again consulted and provided the medical requirements for such a container. Chalmondele then contacted the Ministry of Supply, which produced the perfect container, complete with a label that read, Handle with Care, Optical Instruments. On April 13th, the committee of the Chiefs of Staff met and agreed that they thought the plan should proceed. 
Montague and Tomondale then had to acquire final approval from Winston Churchill himself, the Prime Minister of England. Churchill gave his approval to the operation, but delegated the final confirmation to Eisenhower, whose plan to invade Sicily would be effected. A few days later, Eisenhower also approved the plan. In the early hours of the 17th of April, the corpse of Glyndor Michael was dressed as Major Martin. There was a last-minute hitch, however. Purchase, Montague, and Cholmondele could not put Martin's boots on because his feet had frozen. A heater was found, and the feet defrosted enough to put the boots on properly. After avoiding that disaster, the pocket litter was placed on the body and the briefcase attached. The body was put into the canister, which was then filled with 21 pounds, or 9.5 kilograms, of dry ice, and sealed. As the dry ice sublimated, or transitioned from its solid state to a gas, it filled the container with carbon dioxide and drove out any oxygen, preserving the body without refrigeration. The canister was then placed in the van of an MI5 driver, who had been a racing champion before the war. Chalmondele and Montague traveled in the back of the van, which drove through the night to Greenock, West Scotland, where the canister was taken on board the submarine HMS Seraph. Seraph's commander, Lieutenant Bill Jewell, and the crew had previous special operation experience, but still, secrecy was necessary to avoid any leaks in information. Therefore, Jewell told his men that the canister contained a top-secret meteorological device that was to be deployed near Spain. The HMS Seraph arrived just off the coast of Huelva on the 29th of April, having been bombed twice on the way. At 4.15 a.m. on the 30th, Seraph quietly surfaced. Jewel had the canister brought up on deck, then sent all his crew below except the officers. Jewel and the three officers opened the container. Inside, the body of Martin was revealed. His face was tanned with broken skin, and his lower half was covered in mold. Jewel read Psalm 39, and the body was lowered into the water. Then Jewel ordered the engines to full speed, the waves created by the engines pushing the corpse toward the shore. The canister was filled with water, and after the submarine traveled 12 miles out, it was pushed into the sea. However, the container would not sink. One officer took aim with a machine gun and riddled the canister with bullets, but still it would not sink. Finally, plastic explosives sent the container beneath the waves. Operation Mincemeat was complete. That morning, around 9.30, Jose Antonio Rey Maria, a veteran fisherman, was out on the water searching for sardines when he noticed a strange lump in the water. He soon realized that it was a badly decayed body in a life jacket. He brought it to shore, where it drew a lot of attention from the other fishermen and locals. Jose called over an officer of the Spanish Defense Unit, who sent men to guard the body until a commanding officer could get there. The body stank, and it wasn't long before flies began to circle around it. But the man was in military uniform, so the guards knew it was important to keep it secure until the military could decide what to do. The corpse was soon loaded onto a donkey and moved to the village of Punta Umbria, and then put on a ship to Huelva, where it was handed over to a naval judge. The Spanish officially informed the British that they had found the corpse. A series of pre-scripted diplomatic cables were sent out over the next several days. The British knew these were being intercepted, and although they were encrypted, they knew the Germans had broken the code. The messages gave the impression that it was imperative the briefcase be retrieved. On May 1st, an autopsy was undertaken on Martin's body around noon. British Vice Consul Francis Hazelton, a reliable ally, was present, and worrying that the two Spanish doctors would notice the body had actually been dead for three months, suggested that the post-mortem be closed due to the heat of the day and the strong smell of the corpse. They agreed and signed a death certificate for Major William Martin that stated he died due to asphyxiation through immersion in the sea. The body was released by the Spanish, and Major Martin was buried in the San Marco section of Nuestra Señora Cemetery in Huelva with full military honors the next day. However, the Spanish Navy retained the briefcase, 
And, despite pressure from Adolf Klaus, the German spy, neither it nor its contents were handed over to the Germans. On May 5th, the briefcase was passed to the naval headquarters at San Fernando near Cadiz for forwarding to Madrid. Once the briefcase arrived in Madrid, the head of German military intelligence personally persuaded the Spanish to surrender the documents. Finally relenting, the Spanish removed the still damp paper from its envelope without breaking the wax seal. The letters were dried and photographed, then soaked in salt water for 24 hours before being reinserted into their envelopes. The eyelash that had been planted in the letters had not been noticed and was therefore not replaced. The information was passed to the Germans on the 8th of May and was deemed so important that the head of German military intelligence personally took the documents to Germany. The briefcase, complete with the documents, was returned to Hazelden by the Spanish authorities on May 11th. He forwarded it to London, where the documents were forensically examined. The missing eyelash, plus other tests, confirmed that the letters had been taken out and read. To hide their knowledge that the Germans had taken the bait, another pre-arranged encrypted cable was sent to Hazelden, stating that the envelopes had been examined and that they had not been opened. Hazelden leaked the news, knowing the Germans would feel secure in their acquisition of a secret British attack plan. Final confirmation that the Germans believed the ruse came on May 14th when a German communication that was decrypted by the British warned that the invasion was to be in the Balkans with a feint toward Greece and Sicily. A message was sent to Churchill, who was in the United States at the time, stating that Operation Mincemeat had been swallowed rod, line, and sinker. The final step of the operation came when Montague included Major Martin on a published list of British casualties in the Times. By pure coincidence, the names of two other officers who had died when their plane was lost at sea were published that day, giving further credence to Major Martin's story. On the other side, the Germans called the mincemeat documents the Anglo-Saxon Order and truly believed the Allied attack would come from Sardinia. Hitler informed Mussolini that Greece, Sardinia, and Corsica must be defended at all costs. In fact, by the end of June, the number of German troops on Sardinia had been doubled to 10,000, with fighter aircraft also based there as support, and German torpedo boats were moved from Sicily to the Greek islands in preparation. The Allies invaded Sicily on July 9th. For a considerable time after the initial invasion, Hitler was still convinced that a larger attack on the Balkans was coming, thanks to the mincemeat documents suggesting Sicily was a feint. By the time the German high command realized their mistake, it was too late. Sicily fell on the 17th of August, with many of the Germans evacuating to the Italian mainland. This was the beginning of the end for the Axis powers. World War II ended in 1945 with a victory to the Allies. Much later, in 1977, the Commonwealth War Graves Commission took responsibility for Major Martin's grave in Huelva, and in 1997, they added a postscript on his grave, which reads, Glindor Michael served as Major William Martin, R.M., finally giving the dead man his due recognition. Many people attribute Operation Mincemeat as the turning point in the war. However, military historian John Latimer states that the relative ease of the capture of Sicily was not entirely because of Operation Mincemeat. Other factors contributed, such as Hitler's distrust of the Italians and his unwillingness to risk German troops, and the fact that the Italian troops may have been at the point of surrender already. Historian Ben McIntyre agrees stating that the true impact of Operation Mincemeat is impossible to calculate. We can say, however, that thanks to Mincemeat, only a seventh of the number of predicted casualties occurred, and out of the expected loss of 300 ships, only 12 were lost. Also, the campaign to take control of Sicily had been predicted to take 90 days, but was over in 38. Hitler also continued to believe an attack was coming from Sardinia for a long time after Sicily was taken, which cost him in terms of military strategy. 
Many books have been published since this rather gruesome military operation succeeded. Montague himself wrote The Man Who Never Was in 1953. A film of that same name was made based on the book. British security services limited what Montague could reveal about Operation Mincemeat. However, in 1977, Montague published Beyond Top Secret U, his wartime autobiography, which gave further details of Mincemeat, among other operations. After many of the details were declassified, Ben McIntyre wrote Operation Mincemeat, How a Dead Man and a Bizarre Plan Fooled the Nazis and Assured an Allied Victory. This last one you can find on audible.com. As I mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, just for MCP listeners, audible.com is offering a free audiobook download and a 30-day trial. You can download Ben McIntyre's book or any other audiobook from their massive collection to keep for free, whether or not you keep the service, by going to www.audibletrial.com MCP. You're going to want to keep it, though, because there are so many awesome audiobooks on there. Once again, that's www.audibletrial.com slash MCP to get your free 30-day trial and free audiobook. Getting a free trial also supports the MCP, so I highly recommend it. There is a common saying that all is fair in love and war. War makes things different, and what was once morally impermissible becomes permissible, even glorified. Operation Mincemeat is an example of this. A person would not normally steal a corpse to use in a ruse against their enemies. In most cultures, the presence of the dead or disturbing them in any way is taboo. Once life has left the body, the body becomes a thing to be respected, put away, removed from sight. Sigmund Freud, the founder of psychoanalysis, believes these taboos are due to the fear of the presence or the return of the dead person's ghost. Edward Westermark, a Finnish philosopher and sociologist, feels that death is commonly regarded as the gravest of all misfortunes, and perhaps that is why we fear the dead. But more recently, the idea that the dead can be as useful as the living has come to prominence. Operation Mincemeat is an early example of this. It was definitely unique then, and remains one of the most morbid bits of deception ever done. Montague and Chalmondele must have been like us, unafraid of their morbid curiosity. The Morbid Curiosity Podcast was produced by H. Lloyd. If you'd like to get in touch or suggest a morbid topic for me to talk about, you can tweet the show at Morbid Podcast or find us on Facebook and Instagram at Morbid Curiosity Podcast. If you like the show, please share us on social media and give us a rating on iTunes. Thank you to Sarah for her suggestion and to Elena for sharing some great images of the nutshell studies with us over Facebook. We'll be sharing those images on Facebook with her permission soon, so stay tuned there for a neat peek at those fascinating miniatures. Thank you to Judy, Jessica, Allison, and Angie for emailing the MCP via our website and asking some great questions. Thank you to Roll and Carl on YouTube for your comments. And thank you to Onora for your review on iTunes. Thanks to you, the listeners, our creepy community is growing. The MCP is part of a wider creepy community known as the Belfry Podcast Network. Check out the other shows on the Belfry Network at www.thebelfry.rip. If you like the show, why not support the MCP with a donation? Your gifts go to the research materials we use to create this podcast. If you'd like to donate, you can go to our website, www.morbidcuriositypodcast.com. There you'll find a donation button, links to all our social media, and other ways to contact us. Your donations help us keep the podcast going. We really appreciate your support. My name is Hallie, and until next time... Thanks for listening.